So I had a student in my office just this week asking about an internship offer. This happens quite frequently for me. I teach a class on negotiation, so I get it all the time. Internship offers, job offers, they're quite challenging decisions that these students are confronting. They're not sure what to think. They're even a little bit anxious, they tell me. And they're not just anxious because of the outcomes. They're also anxious because they're on the line, right? Their sense of who they are as a person, their sense of themselves as a confident, capable person is under threat. And as a result, sometimes they just want to avoid making the decision altogether. They just accept the first offer they get, and that way they don't have to make any challenging decisions. Put another way, they accept a worse outcome rather than engaging a challenging decision. So I went to the research literature looking for suggestions on how we could help them make these challenging decisions more effectively. And one of the things that we found is that you don't just have to muddle through, because that's what the students typically find. I'll just muddle through. But in fact, a challenging decision is a bit of a springboard. You can generate creative options that otherwise you never would have imagined. So the student in my office about the internship offer, he asked a very basic question. How can I get them to pay me more money, right? It's the question on everybody's mind. How can I get them to pay me more money? And it sounds like a tactical question, a tactic. What's the right tactic to use to get them to pay me more money? But that isn't why it was challenging. It was challenging because he was confronted by a risk. And that risk narrowed the scope of his thinking to two options. Will they say yes or will they say no? Now, when we confront a risk, we're rolling the dice. We're making a gamble. And we're hoping that it comes out well, but it might come out poorly. If I ask them for more money, they might say yes, but they might say no. And if they say no, they might resent the fact that I asked, and they might hesitate to give me more that they might otherwise have given me. So that's the challenging decision my student was stuck with. And he was stuck. He kept going back and forth between thinking, yes, they'll give me the money, or no, they won't. He was envisioning the future that he wanted and the future that he feared. And his full thinking was in the context of those two options. So what I do in this situation is I put together a quick decision tree with my students. We talk about what the decision is that they're confronting, what the available options are that they might have, what the outcomes are, how likely they are. But the details don't really matter. What matters is to encourage the students to think about multiple options rather than get locked into just two. Now, I know we can do this because in many other domains of life, we handle risks with much more grace. For example, maybe you remember playing tic-tac-toe when you were a child, right? And you thought through, I could move there, I could move here, they could counter-move with this. And you considered a whole range of possibilities, and you engaged with those risks. It's why we don't play tic-tac-toe anymore. It's boring because I look ahead and you look ahead and it's a draw. But that same logic can be applied to these decisions. And rather than getting stuck on one move and the possible options there, I can generate multiple possible options and consider alternative possibilities. So for the student in my office, that was about thinking through what it was he might do other than ask for a raise. We talked about the possibility of which office he would be stationed at. And he realized that being at the downtown office would have a huge influence because that's where he was most likely to get the offer after graduation for the job he really wanted. And that was an easier thing to ask for. And that was an, a less of a risk to take. And so we expanded his view with just a little bit of thinking about possible moves and counter moves. Life is not a game, but the vocabulary of games can be very useful in life. Now, there are other 
challenges that students are confronted by. And some of them are due to not, not enough options, but sometimes more options. And specifically, I had a student recently in my office asking about two different job offers. One, a human resources position at a local company, and the other, an analyst position at a global firm she would be stationed abroad. Two different offers. She had no idea which one to take. They both had advantages and disadvantages. Now, you know the expression for this, right? She was comparing apples and oranges. I always smile at that expression because there are there's very little that's easier to compare than an apple and an orange. They're so similar. And that's a quirk about human thinking. What is most similar is also easiest to find differences, right? But two things that are genuinely quite dissimilar from each other, it's actually hard for us to see why they're so dissimilar. So instead of an apple and an orange, to get a better sense of my student's conundrum, you should think she was comparing an apple and an orangutan. And if you don't really know what to make of that decision, well, that's kind of the point. If you think that to choose between an apple and an orangutan, you have to learn more about apples and more about orangutans, that's not really the issue. The issue is you don't know what you want. This is old wisdom, very old, right? This was carved into marble at the Apollo's temple at Delphi in Greece 2,500 years ago. Know yourself. Know yourself is the solution when you have incompatible options. It's not about the options. It's about which criteria you're going to put on those options to make sense of it. And so what we need to do in this case is figure out who she was and what she wanted. When we articulate our wants, we're articulating ourselves. So, to help her, we talked about two of her selves. I talked to her about if you had a wonderful day at work, what was it that just happened? What was it about that daily experience that made it a great day? And then I also asked her to imagine herself a few years down the line, looking back. If you had accomplished something with all that work and effort over a few years' time, what was it? that you accomplished, and what was it now that you're looking ahead to going forwards? And in figuring out the intersection between her everyday self and her lifelong self, she was able to figure out which of those job offers was the better fit for her. Now, there's a third challenge that I want to highlight that looks like an identity challenge like the last one, but actually I think it's quite different. So another student in my office came to me and he said, I don't know what I should do after graduation. Now, this is a smart, capable individual. He has all kinds of knowledge and talents and skills, but he was confronting the void of a blank page. He had no idea what story he should write on that blank page. Now, you can look at this as an identity question but I think it's much better posed as a question of creativity. Now, I frame it that way in part because of an experience I had many years ago as an art student, long before I became a business school professor. So I'm in the painting studio, and it's six or seven o'clock at night, and in walks the painting instructor. Surprised to see me there, class had ended hours beforehand, How's it going? He said casually. Horrible, miserable, pathetic. I've got nothing. It's just a waste of time. That's great, he said. I wanted to hit the man. <laughs> I was younger then. That's great, he said. You're getting somewhere new. When you get somewhere new, that's a creativity question. And I don't mean creativity in the sense of colorful, or artistic, or you're different than somebody else. What I mean by that is not even that I'm waiting for the muses to strike in with a moment of inspiration. Rather, what I mean by that is we have to go from that blank page of nothingness and having no way to think to generating a perspective from which we can imagine a possible future. 
And that's the situation that my student was in. He wasn't sure what the story was he wanted to write, and we needed to help him find a way to begin writing that story. It requires making initial commitments. Maybe it's committing to a few facts. Maybe it's committing to a few goals. Maybe it's committing to some values. Maybe it's committing to a process. Maybe some of this will help you if you're confronting a difficult decision in your years ahead. Maybe you will be stuck on a risk and realize that you can entertain more options than you're currently considering. Maybe you'll be stuck with incompatible options and realize the problem is you don't really know what you want yet in enough detail to move forward. Or maybe you'll be stuck with a blank page and you'll realize you need to make some initial commitments in order to make progress. Now my student didn't leave my office with a full story, but he left it with a few more things written on that blank page. And I also tried to leave him with a little bit of self-confidence for making challenging decisions, for dealing with the confusion, the anxiety, the threat to his feeling of who he was. By having the courage and looking for the social support to confront that challenging decision and imagine something 